Well, thank you so much for tuning in again to our series on Hebrews. Uh, if you've just joined us, we're going to be in chapter 2, but uh, I am going to say a little bit about where we have been, uh, if you have just joined us. Uh, we've been uh, now for a couple of lessons looking at the book of Hebrews and uh, the, the great and awesome theme that Hebrews is all about, which is the superiority of Jesus Christ. And so we started this by looking at there are seven major points that will be made throughout the book. And um, the Hebrew writer uh, is writing to an Asian Jewish audience, and so he writes in cycles or in circles. Uh, so he'll hit a theme, he'll go out and hit another theme, and then he'll come back to that original theme, and he'll do that over and over. And so it's very difficult to outline this book. Uh, if you take Paul's great dissertation of the book of Romans, you can outline that book just point by point because it's like a dissertation that Paul is writing on the grace of, of, of God and, how, and our need for grace. Uh, but this book is much more about helping individuals uh, turn to Jesus Christ, to see that He is superior, that you should not go to any kind of man-made law or to the Mosaic law of the Old Testament, that you should stay with Jesus Christ and that He is superior. And so uh, last week we looked at chapter 1 of the book of Hebrews and we really only looked at chapter 1, 1 through 3. And, and that is this great where he makes seven points on how Jesus is God, that He is deity. And that was the first point that the Hebrew writer is going to make concerning Jesus Christ. Why is He superior? Well, because He's God. He is God in every way you can think of Him. However you can imagine God, that is Jesus Christ. And so we studied those great words from 2 and 3, verses 2 and 3 of chapter 1, that explain uh, the radiance of His glory, the exact representation of God's nature, these great words that convince people in the 2nd and 3rd and 4th centuries that Jesus Christ is God, and it should convince people today that Jesus Christ is God. And so ever since... Uh, that uh, dilemma or question uh, came up after Jesus uh, ascended into heaven of just who is Jesus Christ. Uh, ever since that question was first announced, uh, as soon as, as Christians went to this text in Hebrews, um, the question's been answered. He's God. And so, so why would you go back to an inferior product? Why would you go back to a law, to to like human endeavors when you can have Jesus Christ himself. And so that's a part of what the Hebrew writer is saying. He's saying, you know, he's superior and his ways are superior because he's God. He's not a second rate being. He's not like, uh, and so that's the way the book begins. And then he, he does some comparison in the rest of chapter one. He says, you know, even the angels understand that Jesus Christ is God. And so there's like great, these great verses like verse 6, let all the angels of God worship Him. Um, and, and are they not ministering spirits to Him? And how the angels minister to others, but to the Son, He says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And so, so Jesus is different. He's not like the created angels. He's superior to any spiritual beings uh, that we have ever known about, like the angels. Uh, and so that was point number one in chapter one. Now, uh, he says chapter two, verse one, for this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For this reason. Um, because if, if that which was spoken through angels proved to be important. He's speaking, of course, of the old Mosaic law and how it was brought through angels. Um, if that was important, how much more important is it the word that is spoken through Jesus Christ? And so he just lends the weight, the gravity to uh, how important this subject matter is, that, that it came through Jesus Christ that he is so much more superior than the angels. So how much more superior is he than this old law? And it was important. If that which was important uh, 
and came in such an important way as being delivered through angels to Moses and the commandments on Mount Sinai, how much more important is the words of Jesus Christ, who, the words of God himself? And so he now transitions us. Again, think of these circles of reasoning that the Hebrew writer is going through. And so he says, there's another reason why we should listen to Jesus Christ. There's another reason that makes him so superior. And I'm actually going to camp out for a couple of lessons on this one. Uh, and so this week we'll get the first half and, uh, and the next week we'll get the, the second half of this concept of, of uh, the second concept of what makes Jesus superior. And that is Jesus Christ was a man. He's not just God, he's also a human. And now all of a sudden, that makes Jesus something else entirely. It's like, wow, wait a minute. We have camped out. We have heard the Hebrew writer say that he's the exact character and nature of God, and now he becomes a man? Whoa. So that's a little different. And that, that understanding that we're about to go through will help us see that, yes, this also makes Jesus superior. This also helps us understand just how valuable and important Jesus is and how we should listen to Him. Remember, because that's, that's the overall flavor of the book. It's like God spoke to us in lots of different ways, but today He only speaks through Jesus Christ. Why should I only listen to Him? Well, because He's God. But number two, He knows what we go through. He's a man, and He understands us. So He not only is God, but he also understands everything about me as a human. So therefore, I should listen to him. And so that's where we're going to be going. And so just a, a few reminders, though, from some of these great texts. You know, every gospel starts out with these great concepts. Uh, John 1, verse 14, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so John will introduce his book by saying, The Word became flesh. Luke will introduce his book in verse 32 of chapter 1 by saying, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will never be an end. Uh, Matthew will say, You shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And then finally, all of us, of course, are very familiar with Isaiah 9, verse 6. For, us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So here are these, these key verses that introduce Jesus in the Gospels. Uh, discussing him becoming a, f a man, becoming to a, coming to us in the flesh. All of that is, is really amazing stuff uh, because how would we ever, we would never have fathomed that plan. We would never have come up with a way for God to save us by him deciding and becoming a human being. It's just amazing. C.S. Lewis would often uh, say this, and anytime he was challenged with this concept, he always would come back to this. The central miracle, the core of Christianity, the miracle of all miracles is actually the birth of Jesus Christ, the incarnation. It's the moment when God is in the flesh when God became a man. And so the Hebrew writer is going to now turn his attention to that concept. And for us, it's very meaningful. Uh, in some ways, it's even more meaningful than Jesus being God. The fact that God would stoop, would become, would allow himself to become a fleshly being is beyond our comprehension. It's like, how much does God love us enough to become a human? Like, to give up deity, to like come to this earth and feel pain and hurt and walk and do all the things humans do. It's just, it's just mind-boggling. And so 
that really does help us understand just how superior God is, how superior Jesus is uh, because of that. And so when we think about the, this text, um, um, we want to get some of the, the same kind of like why questions that the Hebrew writer will do to kind of introduce the concept. And then we'll, we'll really pick it up in verse 9 of chapter 2. So if you're following along, though, we're going to skip back up to about verse 6 because we want to understand that, that flavor of, of the why part. He's like, he's saying, what is man that you would remember him? Or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You know, it's like, why would you care about us? Like, what drove you to, to like, emptying yourself of deity? It's just, it's so beyond our comprehension. And the Hebrew writer will introduce that with us. He's like, he's like saying, you know, <clears throat> why are you doing this, God? Like, what, what made you do this? What would cause the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to be born in a manger in some, you know, small little hamlet and then live his life as a carpenter and die on a cross? It just doesn't make any sense. Um, people who are worth billions of dollars today, like, don't typically, right, generally give it all up and lose all their control and power once they've attained it, uh, especially for someone else. Like, just give it all away. Give up the power, the, the role that they play, and not just the wealth, but all the other things that go with it. The ability to shape and mold and, and like help society, guide society, whatever words they're going to use. Um, that's not something people will give up easily. And yet, why in the world did God do it? And so, why did he become a man? Well, as we go through this, that, that it, that's going to be answered. And then it's going to help us understand what makes Jesus, why this makes Jesus so superior that he would do this. And so, uh, that's these great questions. The Hebrew writer gets, he gets, it's like, it's just so, it's just so like, really God, this is the way you would decide to do this? <clears throat> and it's like, yeah, this is, this is the way God would do it. And so with that, we'll get right into the text. And so let's, I'll start back here in verse nine. So he says, <clears throat> We don't yet see, verse 8, we don't yet see all things subjected to, to man. And it's difficult for us to see all this, but we do see Jesus Christ. So it's tough for us to understand how important all of this is to mankind. But here's what we do see. Verse 9, we see Jesus Christ. And we see him made for a little while lower than the angels. Namely, he was Jesus. So he just, he point blank just says, for a little while we see God becoming in the flesh, coming in the flesh, namely, we saw Jesus. And because of the suffering of death, he was crowned with glory and honor that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. <clears throat> and so the very first point of this is, uh, it's, it's, just, it's just huge. Here it is, verse 10. For it was fitting for him. So it is fitting. It's right for Jesus Christ, uh, by, gr by the grace of God, would become in the flesh and taste death like all humans do. Why was it fitting? Here's why it was fitting, verse 10. For whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory. Ah, it is so powerful a verse. And that's where we want to start. We want to start with that one little phrase. It was fitting for God the Creator to appear in the flesh for one reason, so that many children could go to glory. Period. It is fitting. It's like it's the it's like na it's like the most natural thing it's like the most it's the most it's like the it's the only answer that you could possibly give 
for why deity would give it all up? And there's only one answer. And if you've heard me preach this, you know where I'm going. It's only one reason why God would give everything up. Me. It's the only reason, right? It's like there is no other reason for Jesus Christ to pour out all of his deity and walk on this earth except for us, except for humans, except to find some to, to allow some people to be in a relationship with him forever. It's just it's as always, if we go to Ephesians or we go to Genesis 1 or we go to Revelation, the reason always stays the same. Every text Ultimately, if we go to the ultimate thing, it always pushes us back to there's only one reason God would ever do this. He'd never die on a cross. There's only one reason He created us. There's only one reason He would forgive us. There's only one reason He became in the flesh. He came in the flesh. It's all for one reason, so that we'd have a relationship with Him. Um, you know, all the things that are there. Um, it was fitting, yes. Um, that he was made perfect through suffering. Yeah, that was fitting. Uh, and so we'll, we'll read the whole verse again. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. So do you hear what he said? He's saying, okay, he came to this earth so that we could have a relationship with God. And, 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 it, and it fits. It's like the perfect story. It's like the way it had to be. He's saying, he's saying the, he's saying, this is the way it had to be. If he wants to have a relationship with us, he needed to suffer. He needed to come to this earth and be just like us. It was to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Why is that so fitting? Why is that so right? Uh, why is it that he that he needs to go through this like this, right? You know, we talk all the time about well, Jesus was born sinless and he never sinned, so he was morally perfect, and that's true, and that's one kind of perfection. But the Hebrew writer here is not talking about that kind of perfection. He's not saying Jesus was sinless so he can be the perfect sacrifice for us. No, that'll be later on. Right now, he's talking about Jesus had another kind of perfection. He, he needed to go through another kind of completion, and that only comes by experience. He had to enter fully into the sufferings of this world and emerge victorious over them. Um, he needed to complete this concept of suffering. That's so he can be called the founder of our salvation. That's so he can be... Uh, not just the right sacrifice, but the right high priest for us, the intercessor between God and man. And so he needed to blaze this trail. So let's just read this as a whole for a moment. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren saying, I will proclaim thy name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Since then the children share in flesh and blood. He himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly he did not give help to angels, but he gave help to the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make satisfaction for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. So our point number one is, why in the world did he do this? that he might lead many sons to glory. So he's like the trailblazer. He, goes, he becomes a man so that he can lead us to the glory land. He becomes like us so that he can now lead us 
to the place we need to be, the promised land. He's like, when we talk about him, like Moses being a copy of Jesus, we're not just talking about a prophet concept. Moses was leading the children of Israel to the promised land. But he didn't get to go in because he wasn't perfect. He wasn't, he wasn't the one that was really going to do it. And so now we have the trailblazer, the one who will lead us into glory. You know, we sing that song, into glory land, right? You know, into the glory land we go. It's like Jesus is the first one. He came to take us to eternal glory. And so in bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting for him to do that through suffering. And so that's number two. So number one, everything about his superiority rest on this foundation. There's only one reason why God does what He does. There's only one reason why He created us, He loves us, He does all this stuff for us, He's compassionate, He comes to this earth. There's only one reason, so that He would lead many others to eternal life. It's all about his relationship with us. It's all he desires. It's all he thinks about. It's the only thing he ever, it's his only mission is to have relationship with humans. And he never forgets it. There's not a single day God goes, what am I supposed to be doing again? What am I involved in? What's my work all about? Nope. Every thought, every action, every thing he does, is about our relationship with him. And so he reminds us of that at the very beginning. Jesus had to become a man. If he wants to have a relationship with men, with men and women, he's going to have to become one. And so that's step one, that Jesus, well, he needed to lead many sons to glory. And so he became a man. Number two, the second reason now, 11 through 13 there is that he might be one of us, that he might, he might, right? That's just a part of that natural progression here. So number one, he came that he might lead many to glory. And how's he going to do that? Well, he has to become one of us. He has to be like us. Um, it's like, it's such a powerful statement that, that Jesus had to do this. You know, Let's say for a moment that um, you, know, you go outside and you look at all the stars and uh, you think, well, could a person know that there is a God? Or maybe if you went to the Grand Canyon and you just saw the immense beauty, and, or you went to Yosemite and you saw all the splendor, or, or you went to all the different major falls of the world and saw the water crashing and the tall redwoods, uh, could you be sure there is a God? Well, we know the heavens, right? And the earth declare the glory of God. So we know that, yeah, we should be able to see that there is a God. Yeah. If you look at nature and the intricate design and the pattern of creation, you can know for certain uh, that there's a God who designed all of it and made it and made it all happen. And you could study carefully and see that, yeah, there is a God. Um, but what would you know about God? Um, you know, how much would you know about Him? You know, I think you could know His splendor, His creative ability, maybe His wisdom and power. But if you want to know God's love, if you want to understand like, how much He desires a relationship with you, Analyzing the antelope just isn't going to do it, right? Looking at the little bombardier beetle and discovering what makes a beetle work, that's just not quite going to help us understand what God's love is all about. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I would not know from doing, like studying nature, that God cares about me and knows my very name and understands everything about me and wants to love me and be with me forever. I would get that he's a very powerful being, 
but I need Jesus Christ to come to this earth. I need Jesus in the flesh. I need him to explain to me how much he loves me and to demonstrate that. I'm not going to get it from, well, he loves me because, look, there's a universe and there's planets and there's a sun. Mm. That's why we have Jesus Christ. So that whenever I hear God in the text say, I love you, I know what that really means. What it really means, he gave up deity and came in the flesh and became just like me. Like, how much does the God of the universe love me? I'm the only reason he gave up ultimate power and walked on this earth. Okay, that's a little different illustration of his love for me. That's, that is the depth of this question. We're going to study more next week on this, but we just need to like, it's like, wow, we could stay there forever, couldn't we? This concept of, okay, number one, Jesus is a human so that he would bring a bunch of people to eternal life. So that he could trailblaze. He could, he could take us home. We have no idea how to get there. We don't know the path. We, we just, like, we look, we search, but we have no answers. How do we, what's this life all about? Where are we headed? What happens when we die? We don't know any of that. And so we needed someone to come in advance. We need Jesus to help us with that. And we see that, number one, that's what it's all about. That's, that's the foundation to all of this that he desires a relationship with us. But secondly, I need him to become just like me because that's how he demonstrates his love for me. That's how he understands me. It's how, he, it's how I can understand him. Uh, we talked about this already in the deity component that, that He's the radiance of God's glory. It's like a bright noonday sun looking at an object. And if you really want to see clearly what this object is, you take it out into the bright sun and you can see it. And, it's just, and that's just one of the things that Jesus reflects. It's like, how do I know God loves me? I look at Jesus Christ. I mean, I can say, well, I look and see all the animals and I see the crops and I know that he loves me, but it's, it's not the same as how much does he love me? He loved me enough to give it all up and walk on this earth like I walk, to have pain like I have, to suffer, to work through these things. See, that's what it means to be perfected. God would never be able to understand what I go through unless he became like me. It's just that simple. Uh, the creator of the universe never needs to drink water. He never is like thirsty. He's never hungry. He's never, he's never like questioning like, okay, what's going on here and what's happening over here or, or, or needing counsel or needing to discuss things or having parents or having siblings or being questioned by others like who are you and what are you all about and and then of course all the big things like feeling pain and dying on a cross and death and on and on the list goes but you and I we understand that every day all of us as humans, I, we all know what it means to get up in the morning and not feel well, to get sick, to be afraid, to, to wonder about what's happening tomorrow, to have parents and siblings and friends and spouses and on and on the list goes. That's just common nature. We all understand it. We get it. So if Jesus was going to be perfected in his understanding of us and to have a relationship with us, he's got to become one of us. So that now I really, truly believe, does Jesus understand what I go through? Oh, yeah. He was right there. He spoke to some disciples who didn't understand. He had Roman soldiers that spit on him. He, he had Pharisees that hated him. He had uh, 
the Sanhedrin that wanted to kill him. He had people who thought he was crazy. Others who wanted him to perform miracles and just tried to scam him. It's like all the same things we go through. And that perfected him. That made him into the superior Jesus that we worship and serve today. So what makes him superior? He became just like you and me in the flesh. Uh, what a huge journey for God to go from sustaining every last atom to now, in order to survive, needing some of those atoms to eat and drink in order to just to live like we do as humans. To go through growing up, playing with other children and all that that entailed in an obscure little place in the middle of nowhere over in Israel. What a story. What, a, what the, the depth of his love for us. That is a profound, uh, just something so profound to help us understand his superiority. Next week we'll look at the rest of this chapter, but um, I, I just can't help but be amazed at what God has done for us. And as we talk through that, as, as you personally reconcile that with your understanding of God, um, don't forget what that means. Don't forget how special you really are. Don't forget how much God loves you personally. So that the next time you're wondering, you know, when is God going to fix some of my problems? Or why is, it, why is the world like it is? Or why am I having to go through this? Remember how much He loves you. He's willing to give up the most infinite position there is, the highest position there could possibly be, the creator and sustainer of this universe, and to give that up for only you. If you're the only one he ever has a relationship with for all of eternity, he would do it again. And so it's like, hmm, wow. Maybe he cares more about what's going on today in my life than I think, that I can imagine. That maybe he really does love me. Because look at the, at the, look at the steps he was, he was willing to take for you and I. Wow, that makes him truly superior. Thanks for listening.